Good evening and welcome to Low Observatory celebration of our historic Clark refractor. 125 years ago, it saw first light. Um, and so this year we're celebrating um, this historic telescope. It's, it's really one of the most storied telescopes, not just in the country, but in the world, because it has been used for so much important research um, through the years. Um, probably most notably, the first detection of the expanding universe. Um, Apollo astronauts used it as part of their training for going to the moon. Um, lots of great research done through the years. And then in recent decades, it's been the centerpiece of our public program, um, where more than, it's hard to say, probably more than 2 million people have looked through it. Um, and so it's really a great tool of inspiration, both because of the research it was used for, and then for just for all of us to be able to look through and inspire us about the night sky. And so it's a really great um, thing to celebrate. 125 years, it was built before Arizona was even a state. Um, several presidents, of course, have passed by since, it's, since it was first used. Um, it's a real icon of Northern Arizona. If you come up to Flagstaff, you see this big white dome on the side of the hill, it looks like a big upside down bucket or a birthday cake. That's this telescope um, in the dome it contains. So it's really an iconic part of the Flagstaff skyline and a, a really critical part of astronomical history. Um, and it helped lay the groundwork for the research that we continue to do today and continue to thrive at today. Um, so we've been doing these celebration programs every month and we're gonna do this through the rest of the year. And we're also gonna do a special program on the night of the 23rd because that's the night in 1896 that Percival Lowell and his staff first looked through the eyepiece of the Clark Telescope. So that was the first light of the telescope. So we'll do a special program that night also. Um, for these monthly programs, um, we've started out talking about some historic aspect of the telescope because there, it's so cool because there's so many funky different things about it. Um, from when, when we talked about some of the unique features like the frying pan, dust cover, and, and things like that. Um, we've talked about different eyepieces used, um, the dome itself, and how it's changed through the years, how it was used in Mexico. Um, and tonight we're going to talk about some of the different observing chairs that was used through the years. And at first glance, that might sound really boring, but it's really kind of cool. And you see that astronomy is actually can be an adventure sometimes when you see some of these chairs. So um, we're going to start out talking about that. And then we're going to talk about one of the research um, areas of focus with the Clark Telescope, and that was double stars. And we'll talk about that a little bit and then transition into modern times, how we still study these today. And Dr. Lisa Prado will be joining us um, to talk about that. So first of all, let me share my screen. Um, my name is Kevin Schindler, and I'm the historian here at Lowell Observatory. And this is cool because I get to talk about this stuff all the time. And I, I think it's really fascinating because it's not just, you know, historic stuff for the sake of history, but it's the foundation of our observatory and um, the foundation of the research that we do today. And so it's really fun, I think, to look back at this, um, things like the Clark Telescope. So let me get this set up to the first slide. And I believe that's showing correctly. So. The telescope was built in 1896 in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, meanwhile, the dome was actually built in downtown Flagstaff at an empty lot at the corner of, I think it was Dale and Humphrey Street. Um, and it was owned by the Sykes brothers who uh, owned a bicycle repair shop called Makers and Menders of Anything. And they're the ones who built um, the dome at, their, at the car lot. Um, and I'm not sure, but I believe that land is still owned by the family, um, a, gra a um, granddaughter, granddaughter or niece of the Sykes is Diana Gabaldon, um, the famous um, author. So she's tied into Lowell Observatory. She's connected to the, the Sykes family. So the telescope was built in 1896. They brought it out here to Arizona, tested it out um, here on Mars Hill at the observatory. And then they took it down to Mexico because they wanted to observe Mars. And there's a good opposition to Mars when Mars is 
relatively closer to us. Um, but it wasn't going to be seen as well in Flagstaff, but the more south you go, the better it would be. So they got a spot near Mexico City and set the observatory up there. And so this is really the first observing chair we had in the dome. This is Andrew Douglas, who helped found the observatory um, and was an early astronomer here. And his name is really critical in science because he later moved down to Tucson and not only started or um, um, started the Stewart Observatory down there, which is still operating today, but also is the founder of dendrochronology, um, the study of tree rings. Um, so really important scientists. So this is Andrew Douglas down in Mexico. Um, and you notice if you're familiar with the Clark Telescope Dome, um, it looks a little different because the floor is flat here. Um, when they brought it back to Mexico, they put it, they dug a pit in the floor so that as they add instruments on to where the eyepiece is, instead of the eyepiece they put like a spectrograph on, it's so long it would hit the floor, so they put a pit in, um, so it's a little bit deeper. That's why, so you, if you look at this picture, you know this is in Mexico. But this is the first observing chair they had. Um, here's another picture also in Mexico. Um, and with this, um, you know, the observing chair, the idea is that, you know, this is before the days of cameras. Um, to make observations, you're looking through an eyepiece and sketching in details with a, with a notepad. And so you want to get somewhat comfortable if you can, um, because you're going to be sitting there for tens of minutes or hours. And so, you, you know, th these ladders are designed to where there's a little platform. You can move up or down depending on where the eyepiece is. And the height of the eyepiece is going to change. The lower something is in the horizon you're looking at, the higher the eyepiece is going to be. Um, so you need to have something comfortable to sit on and the ability to, to move at different heights. And so this is one observing chair that sure doesn't look very comfortable to me. Um, and you can imagine if you're doing this for a couple hours, that would be really hard to do. Um, that, here's another picture of that observing chair um, when they brought it back to Flagstaff. And I show this because this is a picture of VM Slifer with the spectrograph attached to the telescope. And he's standing on that ladder. And this is the instrument he used, used in his um, observations, the things that in space are generally moving away, the so-called redshift, um, the first evidence that the universe is expanding. So he, he was using this ladder um, when he was doing those, those studies. Now, here's a pretty precarious um, setup. And I would say that today, OSHA would not approve of a setup like this. And this is Percival Lowell. He was looking at Venus at one point. And Venus is always going to be fairly close to the sun. Um, at this point, he was looking at Venus when it was just on the horizon. And so this, I mean, this is really a contraption of a setup. This ladder going up here to the platform and then up here again. I mean, that just does not look stable at all. They didn't use this setup very often, but it was a way to get really high above the regular ladder. Because you can see there, here's the, the bottom floor. And then this part is where the top, the rotating part, the dome up here sits on it. So he's sitting way up there. Here's a good one. I'm not sure if um, Dr. Prado has used an observing ladder like this, but you got to wonder how stable this is if you're trying to look for a long time and make uh, drawings. It doesn't look like this would be a very good option. And I'm not sure, but I think this is a, a device on here, a Phylar micrometer that they use to measure um, the size of things like the diameter of stars and planets and such. Um, I think that's what's on there. But that's another observing ladder. And this is great. Again, you know, I'm not sure if OSHA would approve of this, but we've got this ladder hanging by all these ropes. And then you've got this little step sitting on top of that. So um, I don't know, it doesn't look very stable to me. I would say that the ladders we have today are a lot better than that. I think if, you, if you're familiar with the observatory, you've, you've seen this picture somewhere along the way. It's probably one of the most iconic, if not the most iconic pictures having to do with the observatory. And this shows Percival Lowell sitting at the Clark Refractor um, in 1914. And this is a complete posed shot, but still it's a cool picture. 
And this is him sitting on a different observing ladder, um, similar to the first the one we saw, but it's got a bigger platform and you have a chair on it. Um, and again, this platform will go higher or lower depending on you know, what you're looking at. And then it's also on wheels. If you look at the bottom here, there's a set of wheels here, another set here. So you can move it back and forth in the dome depending on what you want to look at. Um, and so this ladder is still in the dome today. It's been there now for more than 100 years. And we don't really use it today um, because it's, it's unwieldy to have visitors get on top of this and move the platform and everything. We have a, a traditional ladder, step ladder we use in there um, that, that rolls. But this, this one is still probably the most iconic ladder. And as a last slide of these different observing ladders we've shown, I want to show this picture. Um, this is, of course, for most of us, I say, of course, this is Carl Sagan. And Carl Sagan um, visited the observatory in the, gosh, I guess the early 1980s when he was filming the original Cosmos television series. Um, one of the episodes was called Blues for a Red Planet um, about Mars. And he came here and, and Carl Sagan was really enamored with Percival Lowell because Lowell, you know, while today we know that so many of, idea, of his ideas were just wrong, he really had such a, a compelling way of speaking and writing that inspired people to want to either prove or disprove his theories or in the more popular culture, it inspired science fiction um, and this idea, this consciousness that there's life out there. Even though the life that he envisioned just isn't on Mars, it got us thinking about life in the universe. And in fact, today, whenever there's mention of any possibility of life somewhere in the solar system, you can bet Percival Lowell's name is gonna be mentioned um, because he really, again, built this consciousness about life out there. I, I show this, this uh, picture because um, Carl Sagan is in it, in the um, observing ladder, which is pretty neat. Um, and, and so today, while we don't use it for viewing very often, um, we have another one for a public, it is fun to get somebody like Carl Sagan when he was here to use the ladder. But I also mention it because our guest tonight, Dr. Lisa Prado, has a bit of experience with Carl Sagan in a very non-astronomical sense. So with that, I'm going to bring you on, Lisa, to maybe tell us about your connection with, with Carl Sagan, and then we'll um, talk a bit about double stars. So when I was a very junior student, I went to my very first conference and I was extremely nervous. And there were all these famous people. It was actually a very small conference. It was a Gordon conference, which is a interdisciplinary um, program for these, these great conferences. I think it was like geophysics and astronomy. And, um, and so I was, I was sort of stricken with shyness and I was sort of hanging around with this grad student who, um, from my institution who was also there and tagging around behind him. And at the, after the dinner break, there was um, some free time and there was a ping pong table in this sort of common room. And so this grad student and I were gonna play ping pong. So he said, hang on one second, I'm gonna go get something to drink. So I'm standing there with a, my ping pong paddle and Carl Sagan walks up and he says, looking for an adversary? And I said, yeah. <laughs> so I abandoned my, my grad student, uh, colleague, friend, and I um, played ping pong with Carl Sagan and I beat him. So that was very satisfying. And that's my only connection with Carl Sagan, sadly, but um, we had a lot of fun. So that was- I suspect there's, there's more of a larger scale professional connection of inspiration and you're both um, scientists who also inspire the public about space. Um, the stuff that you do, Lisa, I mean, I've, I've seen Lisa give programs to groups of all ages and, and um, you really have a way of just getting people jazzed up about it, much like Carl Sagan did. So I would say you have more in common with them than you think. So let me, let me stop sharing here. And we're gonna talk about um, some of the research that was done with the Clark and that was binary stars. Um, and um, binary stars, again, it's one of those things you hear it and say, oh, that sounds exciting. But there actually is really cool stuff about that. Um, before we talk about that, um, we got a question that came in. Um, could you use a photographic plate to make images with a telescope or could you only look through it? Um, that's a good question. 
Um, and, and the answer is both. Um, early on when, when Percival Lowell and his, his assistants first started using the telescope in 1896, it was all sketching by hand. Um, and you can imagine sketching by hand is a very subjective thing. Um, and so when astrophotography was being developed, um, but it, it was about, gosh, the early 1900s, um, just a few years after the observatory started, when we started, when they started doing um, photographic glass plates um, and really experimenting a lot with those. And, you know, you think about some of the early staff who worked here um, under Percival Lowell, one was VM Slifer, who, who made the recessional velocity, the expanding universe discoveries. But his brother, his younger brother, who is probably lesser known, but was an equally remarkable scientist and also one time mayor of Flagstaff. But E.C. Slifer, um, at one point, took more pictures of Mars than anybody else in the world. He really um, did a lot of experimenting with, with cameras on the Clark Telescope. And, and, in, and we know today that he did some of the first image stacking um, that was just being experimented with at that time. He, he developed a lot of the techniques um, that are still used today um, with more modern equipment, but, but still. Um, so that's a good question about how to gather images. And in fact, it's really important because VM Slaffer took spectra on glass plates and that's how he detected the expanding universe and his brother made some of the first um, really excellent images of planets um, based on the stacking technique. Um, so it's kind of cool. So throughout this series, we've, we've talked about different research done with the Clark and um, you know, tonight we're grateful that we're getting rains and flag stuff. Um, but what that means is we can't look through the telescope. Um, but we do have an image of a double star that um, we often look at through the telescope. It's called Elbirio. And I believe Danielle um, or Alex or um, Heather, somebody, some combination of our back team is going to bring up an image here um, and show Elbirio. Um, Elbirio is really neat, and it's, it's, you know, we show it because it's, a, it's one of the most interesting double stars to look at because of its colors. It, it's two distinct colors, um, and it represents, you know, a lot of other stars like it that researchers started with um, a guy named TJJC back in the 1890s, who was a, I would say, an infamous person in astronomy. Um, he, he started his double star work in the 1890s. And if we jump ahead to the 19, gosh, 1980s even, um, Otto Franz, modern day astronomer, some of the last research done with the Clark was again, double star work um, between that and mapping the moon. So the Clark was used a lot for, for um, this double star work. And, and, and today we'd like to represent that by looking at things like Alberio. I mean, We'll look at moon and planets and other stuff that are a little bit more <laughs> dramatic to see, but sometimes there's just none of that in up in the sky. So we'll look at Albirio, and that's great through a little telescope. And and Lisa, maybe you can say a couple of things about Albirio, um, and then and then we can talk about double stars in general, and maybe a little bit about um, the work of the early scientists here, but then how that ties into your research today. Okay, got the unmute. Yeah, so Albirio, I'm not the best uh, amateur astronomer in the world, but what I know about it is that you can actually, through a telescope, you can you can discern the two components and they look very different in color. And, and color is so interesting because it tracks temperatures, right? I mean, if you take a blowtorch and you take a nail and you heat it up, you'll see the nail change color. And Oddly enough, we think of blue as cool, but oddly enough, as you get hotter and hotter and hotter, blue is indicative of, of extremely high temperatures. And that's how it is with stars. And so we think we talk about red hot, but actually blue hot is even hotter. And so stars range from these extremely massive objects that are, ex that are extremely hot and that burn their, their energy, their, their fuel very, very rapidly. And so Albirio is actually made up of three stars. There's um, two of these sort of very massive gigantic stars that are 
which we call bee stars. They're extremely hot and blue, and they're very, very close, so we can't actually discern those. But when you look through Albireo in a telescope, you can see A, the A component, which has, a, has one of these blue ones kind of blended in with it because it's way too close. And you can see B, and the, the A component is made up of one of these blue ones, but also of a very red one, of a super giant. And so it's um, actually extremely red. And so Albireo appears to be this big red star and then the smaller blue star, which is um, the B component is the smaller blue one. It's another of these sort of B stars. And so you can actually see these colors and those are indicative of the, the red one, even though it's so big, is actually big because it's fluffy. And um, that's a later stage of stellar evolution. Stars actually expand and they get bigger. And the, um, the B component is actually at a, at not so evolved. And so it's still um, quite hot and it appears blue. The red one appears quite big because it's fluffy and it's cooler. Um, and so that's Albireo A and B and that's why it has the appearance that it does in the sky. And that system is about, um, about let's see, three, uh, 400 or so, 430 light years away. So the light we're getting from there started journeying to us 400, 430 years ago. So that's kind of cool to think of. So astronomy really looking through a telescope or imaging through a telescope is really like looking through a time machine. Um, you're, you're looking at something that happened seconds, minutes, hours, years, millions of years ago. So let's talk about these double stars. First of all, what is double star? I mean, it, the name seems to indicate what it is, but maybe you can tell a little bit more about what a double star is and, you know, how typical they are and, you know, are there triple stars or quadruple stars? Uh-huh. Yeah, so you know, the, the terminology is really interesting. I hadn't appreciated this so much. I was reading a little bit about this in, back in the winter. And people used to talk about double stars um, hundreds of years ago because they, they would make observations. The skies were quite dark and, um, and it was easier, I think, to make observations. And they, people started to see through small telescopes that there were, there were lots of pairs of stars, like Albireo, for example. And so people spoke about double stars. And, um, and yet, you know, some of the early researchers in this field paid a lot of attention. They, they did what's called time domain ob observing. And that means that you go back to the same object again and again. And it's, it's very powerful and it's very cool. And so they discovered that if they kept going back to these same, what appeared to be double stars, they moved, you know, it's like Galileo's saying when yet it moves. Yes, they actually moved. So on the sky, you'd see these two points and you went back a couple years later and they would be like this. You went back a couple years later, they'd be like this. They actually had orbital motion. And so I think it was sometime around 1720s maybe roughly in the first part of the 18th century where somebody's like, these aren't just double, they aren't just like sort of in the same, you know, projected part of the sky. These are actually moving around each other. But Newton had already developed the theory, the gravitational, his theory of gravity. And so they understood that this was actually gravitationally bound systems. And so that has, that has tremendous power because once you know something about the orbit, how long the orbit takes, um, and you can actually, and you can map it out and you can see whether it's a perfect circle or whether it's kind of more like an oval. Um, once you know more about the properties of that, you can determine things like the total mass of the system. And, and if you know the speeds with which the stars are moving, you can determine something about the individual masses of the two stars or the mass ratio, which is pretty cool when you start thinking about looking at things that are hundreds of light years away and measuring how much they weigh. So um, that's one of the things that I love about binary stars. You can make these fundamental measurements um, at um, you know, great distances and it seems pretty crazy. Um, I just saw a question in the chat about, can you check planets around Albireo? Yeah, you, potentially you could. Um, now I feel bad because I haven't actually paid much attention to Albireo, and I don't know off the top of my head if there are planets around it, but 
Sure. You know, we can look at all of these stars and we can look at different things. We can look at the, we can look at the, um, the transits. So planets sometimes transit stars. You can see a little dip in the light as a planet goes across it. And you can look at the radial velocities and, and you can see if the star is moving because there's a planet orbiting it. So there's different techniques for looking for planets. And Alberio seems like a perfectly fine candidate, although it's a complicated system because there's actually three stars there. Um, and so, yeah, that you, you could look for planets around Alberio. I'm not sure they've found any yet. Um, and I don't know if it's the target in one of these programs. Typically these exoplanet programs try to keep it simple and they look mostly for stars that are, they look for planets around stars that are single because it makes life much, much easier. But the Kepler mission, which has been stared at the same little square in the sky, actually in the same direction as, uh, of the sky as um, Alberio in the constellation Cygnus. And they saw, um, they saw, like they looked at hundreds of thousands of stars for years, just over and over and over, just watching them, watching for transits. And they did see transits in some binary systems. So we do know you can have planets in some binary systems. And Lisa, okay. here's, a, here's another a kind of a fun follow-up question. If there were planets, and really it's whether it's around Alberia or other stars, would, you know, a binary star, would the planets go around both stars or just one? Yeah, um, I just saw that. Um, yeah, so you have both. If the, plan if the stars are far enough apart, you can have circumstellar planets. If the stars are closer together, you can have circumbinary planets. The, the, a component, so the so Alberio has this this red giant star, and then it has this blue um, companion, and the the giant one also has a blue another blue star, kind of so close that we can't distinguish them, and those are um, are um, I guess actually don't don't quote me on that. I'm not entirely clear about the configuration. But there's, um, but I think that's the case. I think that's the A star has the, the another component. So AA and AC is the way we talk about it. Those two are really close, but the period is still 120 years. So it's still quite large. And the, then the period between that, those two stars that can form the A component and then the B one, those are gonna be thousands of years because if we can see it through a small telescope, then it's going to take a long time for those stars to go around each other. So I bet you there's no circumbinary planets around A, A and B. And I don't even think there's probably any around AA and its close companion AC. But you do have, and Kepler found, you do have systems with the stars that are very close that orbit each other in just a few days, like tens of days or like in a few months. And there are circumbinary planets there. And in wider binaries, there are circumstellar planets. Okay. It, it's really fascinating to see how many possibilities there are. And with the technology we have, you know, finding these things now. It hasn't been that long ago that exoplanets was the, is in the area of theory. And now we're discovering so many, like virtually every day. So let's go back to the Clark a second. For them to, you know, study binary stars, it was pretty basic in the early days. Um, you know, you observe them, you could measure them using like a micrometer or something like that. But, you know, the, the basic techniques they did then compared to what you do now, I mean, what kind of instrumentation do you use? And, you know, like, it's not just you, you have a whole team working on these things. Um, so what, what kind of projects and what kind of focus areas are they, are you guys doing with the research too? So um, I look at different kinds of binaries. I look at the very, very close ones um, and, and, and pretty much almost all of the binary stars that I study are very young. And that's because I have a strong interest in, in star formation and in planet formation. And, planets form around young stars. So if you look at young stars, you get to see something about young planets, um, hopefully. And so I look at extremely young systems. I look at, for the binaries, I look at very, very, very close pairs and that have periods. In other words, the two stars orbit each other like a full rotation, you know, full 
orbit, like the Earth goes around the sun. That's like a, the Earth's orbit around the sun. So these two stars and the systems I look at go around each other in two days or in eight days or 20 days or um, 90 days. So these are, these are relatively short orbital periods. And the virtue, as I was saying a minute ago, if you can actually map out the, the orbit very um, in, in great detail, so you take a whole bunch of observations and you don't wanna like do a system that has a period of 120 years because humans don't live that long. And so what you wanna do is build up a lot of systems that you have these, these orbits for that you can do reasonably well in your career or during grad school or as a postdoc. So you, you, you look for systems that you can learn a bunch about in some reasonable period of time. It would be nice if we could learn more about the wider systems, but it takes, it takes many decades. And so I look at these, they're called spectroscopic binaries because the only re- way you can tell that they're actually two stars there is you have to look at the spectra. And what the spectra are, sort of the thumbprints or the fingerprints of the, of the light that are coming out, the energy coming out of those stars as it goes through the atmosphere, the, the surface layer of those stars, different, depending on the temperature of the star and depending on how fluffy it is and depending on what kinds of um, elements, what its metallicity is, how, what kinds of elements you have there in that outer layer, <clears throat> you get a very specific um, sort of fingerprint of, of, from each star. So I can look at the spectra of the two stars and I can see they're actually moving. And that's because the, they're actually like blue shifted and red shifted as the two stars go around each other. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a blender. It's kind of like a mixer. And so I can actually, from the spectra being shifted back and forth, I can measure the speed of each star and I can measure the mass ratio of the two stars. I also look at um, more widely separated stars and I look at what are called disks. Um, And the disks, these sort of primordial disks, these circumstellar disks, and these are where planets form. And to me, that's the really, really cool thing for these wider binaries because I can study what the, how big the disks are, how long they last. And these, in the, only in these very young systems do you see the disks because later on the disks are gone and the planets have formed out of the disks. So, so that's quite interesting to understand the disk properties as a function of, you know, whether binary is closed or the binary is very massive, you know, is the orbit, is the orbit a circle or is the orbit like more like an oval? Um, there was this question about, I hope we don't live in a binary star system. <laughs> Indeed, that could spell doom. <laughs> and yeah, it's pretty unlikely that we have a companion. So I would not um, worry about that. We have more pressing worries on our planet. Um, so yeah, don't you worry about the, the doom. You were entirely correct though. There are systems where they, you can cause instabilities for those disks around each star and for those young planets forming around each star. You know, it, you can have these kinds of dynamical interactions that for a few million years, they're okay, nothing bad happens. And then bit by bit, you get these, these small changes that sort of begin to add up and you can cause instability and the planets get thrown out of the system or like perturbed and fall into one of the stars. So, and I, and I would think if there was a companion planet, we would know easily because, because we know what the motions around of the planets around the sun should be based on the mass of the sun and the interaction with the planets, masses and everything. So if there was something else out there, we would expect, we would be able to see that in the gravitational motion, I would think. Yes, that's exactly right. Somebody just asked about planet X and, um, yeah, so that what they see are certain properties of orbits of the minor planets, which are these, you know, extremely small bodies, which orbit way outside of our, you know, the regular planets in the solar system. And so you look at the, you look at the sort of trends in these orbits of these minor planets or these um, Kuiper belt objects, these different small bodies in the outer solar system, you can say, ah, oh, it looks like they might have some influence from something. They all have this kind of trend and therefore there's probably some other planet way out here and and um, there's a team at Northern Arizona University and um, 
Carnegie Institute in Washington. There's a bunch of people who are looking to see, and, and at Cal, California Institute of Technology, they're looking for this, um, this planet X, which Christopher Lowell did too. <laughs> um, but his calculations were actually wrong. So it was extremely lucky that Clyde Tombaugh found Pluto where he first looked for it in that first year. Excellent luck because the calculations were not actually the best. Yeah, it was based on inaccurate estimates of, of the sizes of Uranus and Neptune, the masses. If they had known the true mass, it would have all, you know, flattened out. But yeah, it is a really a remarkable example of um, serendipity that they, this is where a planet should be. Oh, there's a planet, but it's not that one. But it's a testament to Clyde Tombaugh and how detailed he was. And, you know, if you look hard enough somewhere, you, you know, you're bound to find something, I guess. Well, I don't know. It's, the sky is big. I think there's some element of luck there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Serendipity. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they're finding that with the searches for Planet X. They're, you know, they're searching and searching. They're using, you know, big telescopes and they're going very deep searches for things that are very far away or a thing that's very far away. It's very difficult and it's very um, resource intensive, which I suppose is probably what Clyde Tombaugh was saying, whatever it was, 80 years ago, like, wow, this is taking up a lot of really important telescope time, but it only took them a year and they've been looking for Planet X for a while. So I don't know how that's going to you were You were talking about some of the different things that you study. Let's talk about the tools of the trade. You were talking about a spectroscope. I mean, how do you, how do you get your observations? What telescopes do you use? And what other instruments are on there to record the information you need? Mostly it's, um, I use spectroscopy because spectroscopy contains so much information about um, so many different characteristics of a star. So I've been doing um, spectroscopy mostly in the infrared through my career. And the reason why I use the infrared, which are wavelengths that are longer than the wavelengths that we're sensitive to with the naked eye. So if you, if you touch your arm, it's probably, you can feel that it's warm. That's infrared radiation, that's sort of heat radiation. And you think about young stars. So my, you know, my specialty is young stars because I want to know how stars form. I want to know how these disks form. I want to know how they evolve and um, you know, what impact binaries have on them. But you think about that, okay, now think about um, things like the Orion Nebula. Um, and so it's beautiful when you look at it through binoculars or a small telescope, but part of that beauty is because there's all sorts of dust. And that's because it's a star forming region. And there are these great big clouds, mostly made of gas, but there's also a lot of dust in them. Like the Horsehead Nebula is a great example of dust. <laughs> and so it's this cool, dramatic feature in Orion, but, um, but it's this, this dark dust that's like blocking the background um, vis visible light. And so the thing about infrared, looking using infrared astronomy or infrared telescopes and instruments is that you can actually see through some of the dust. You can actually see a little bit deeper into things. And in these star forming regions where I'm looking at these young binaries, I want to see through the cloud so I can actually, um, I can actually get good observations of these young stars. The other thing that's kind of cool about the infrared is that the Earth's atmosphere, of course, Im impacts us when we're, when we're using telescopes to observe stars outside of our atmosphere, very far away. But the Earth's atmosphere um, is a little bit more stable in, in the infrared in a certain sense. So the, the, the scene, the image quality can be a little bit better in the infrared. And also the stars I look at are, are they're right now they're quite cool because they're very young. As they grow up, they're gonna get hotter. They're going to, right now they're a little bit fluffy because they just formed. And so they're, they're still contracting to their sort of stable phase that, that, they'll, that the sun is in is a very stable phase. It's sort of midlife. These young stars are in the tantrum baby phase, but they're going to continue contracting and they're gonna heat up. And so right now they, they appear to be quite cool because they're a little bit fluffy. Fluffy things are, tend to be cooler. 
um, as far as stars go. And so I can, I can look, the, most of their light is actually emitted in the infrared. So that's another advantage. As they grow up, more of their light will be emitted in the visible because they'll get hotter and they'll emit more light at shorter wavelengths. But um, I use telescopes all over the place. I use the Keck telescope in Hawaii for a lot of my work um, because these young stars are in star forming regions that are pretty far away. So I need a big telescope. I've used the um, McDonald Observatory 2.7 meter telescope quite a bit. Um, I've used the four meter telescope. West in Texas. Yes, in West Texas, um, in Fort Davis, Texas. And that's got a very groovy visitor program there too. Um, and I've used the four meter telescopes in um, at Kitt Peak in Southern Arizona and in Chile, the Blanco telescope in Chile, the Gemini telescope in Chile. Um, I've used the the VLT telescope, the European Very Large Telescope, uh, it's eight meter telescopes. They're also in Chile. Um, yeah, all over the place. <laughs> and are, are these mostly ones you travel to or is some of that remote now? Some of it is actually Q observing. So it's not even really remote. Um, and some of it is remote even before the pandemic. The NASA Infrared Telescope Facility in Hawaii, that has allowed remote observing for almost 20 years now, but you can also still go there. Mm -hmm. Keck is kind of remote. You have to go to a special Keck observing place, um, and, or you can go out to their headquarters in Hawaii, but typically you don't go to the summit. My first three or four Keck runs were at the summit because um, I worked with Andrea Guez at UCLA as a postdoc, and we worked with a team that brought a visiting instrument there to look at binary stars to understand mm -hmm something about their about their discs and um, the survival of their discs. So that was super fun. Um, I actually got to see Keck and observe at Keck. There's another question that says, is our sun going to be nice to us for some years to come? Yes, it is. That is the good news. You've got 5 billion years. So have kids and have grandkids and enjoy that. We're good. Sun is very stable. The sun, stars like the sun are stable for about 10 billion years. Stars that are like um, Albireo B, not so much. Those won't be around for more than a few hundred million years or so. And stars that are the most massive and most dramatic and burn their energy the fastest, the O stars, are only around for a few million years, which is kind of crazy. Because the young stars that I study, young, 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 to me is like two million years. <laughs> and those stars don't really grow up until they hit, you know, like 500 million years. And so, yeah, it just depends how massive the star is you're studying. It's kind of crazy. If you study the most massive stars, they're, they, they live fast, die young. <laughs> the <laughs> ones that I study, they live for um, many, many billions of years. Um, even tens of billions of years, the very low mass ones. But I'm curious about our sun and our solar system. So I tend to study stars that are going to grow up to be similar to the sun. In effect, we, some of our colleagues here at Lowell Observatory, including our director, um, Dr. Jeff Hall, um, Dr. Wes Lockwood, one of our Meridae um, astronomers and others, Brian Skiff has helped out with this project looking at the sun and sun like stars. Um, and that's a project that went on at Lowell for decades. That started decades ago, um, and and so the observatory historically was known as a solar system observatory, focusing on things in our solar system, um, like the sun. But also, there's so many more things that you and our other scientists do today besides that. Um, really getting out to you know be well beyond the solar system and to galactic and extra galactic type things. And it looks like we are just about out of time. Um, so Dr. Lisa Prado, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Can I say one more thing? Oh, yes. So um, Kevin alluded earlier to Otto Franz, who was an astronomer at Lowell. I think he arrived in Lowell in 1964. Is that right, Kevin? Right around there, yeah. Yeah, and he only just left Flagstaff um, a few months ago, um, probably about 10 months ago, he moved um, to be closer to his kids and grandkids, but he worked at Lowell for decades and decades, and he worked on binary stars and has been a great pleasure of my career to work with Otto. And we were just collaborating with some other scientists on a paper that just was published in the last 
months. And, um, and so he, it's a, what an amazing career. I should be so lucky to be able to work on binaries for so many years. Otto's contributions are absolutely, absolutely fundamental. And Otto really is kind of legendary in these parts. I mean, he was one of the people that helped found the Arboretum at Flagstaff. Um, he was also the secretary treasurer of the observatory for years, served on all sorts of boards around Flagstaff. And it's kind of that, you know, kind of typical low observatory person that really is involved in the community. And I think that's one of the neat things about the observatory is um, we're not the ivory towers up on the side of the hill, turning our noses up at everybody, you know, part of the community. And it's fun to be able to share um, the excitement of space um, with, with on-site programs, with virtual programs like this, with our astronomers like, like Lisa Prado, who um, has a lot of research and other things going on, but um, still takes time to, to uh, talk to us and, and share the excitement of space. So thank you, Lisa, for joining us tonight. And thanks to our behind the scenes folks, Danielle Adams and Alex Elbert for making everything run smoothly. Um, and thanks for joining us. And we'll see you next month as we continue to celebrate um, the 125th anniversary of the Clark Refractor. <laughs>